praise. Amen? Amen. 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 I don't know what, what y'all have to say about it. But my choir sung this morning. I don't care what y'all got to say about it. All right? Amen. No good to that. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to invite your attention just for a few moments to the, the New Testament book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, and I want to anchor our thoughts there for just a couple of moments. I want to read a couple of verses, very familiar verses, as we will continue with this theme this morning around this idea of vision. Acts chapter 2. Look at verse 14. I'm reading this morning from the King James Version of the Holy Scripture. Acts 2, 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, said God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. May God's rich blessing be to the reading of his word and may it be sanctified in the hearts and minds, souls, and spirits of God's people. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for the instant of your word gives light. Now speak to us one more time with perennial freshness, with power, with insight, and with laser precision, the wonderful works of Christ. To the end, that our souls might be built up, our spirits edified, our minds enlightened, that those who have not come to faith in Christ, their hearts might be open, and they might, might cry, what must I do to be saved? In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to continue our thoughts this morning from this theme that we started some five weeks ago, from the subject of the, the power and the passion of vision. The power of and the passion of vision. I've shared this quote before, but it's worthy of repeating for those who've not heard it. The great author, Helen Keller, who was born blind. And also she was born mute and deaf. And her teacher was trying to break through some thought that she was mentally retarded. But if you can't see and if you can't hear, then you can't learn to speak. And this one teacher who believed that she could have a breakthrough and commit her life to trying to communicate with her. And she had a breakthrough one day and she was able to learn to teach her by signing her hand and then having her touch objects and then describing what those objects were. And Helen Keller went on to be one of the brilliant minds that our country has produced. And one day someone asked her the question, is there anything worse than being blind and unable to see? And she said, yes, having eyes to see, but no vision. Having eyes to see, but no vision. And so many of you here this morning, you have eyesight much better than my own. I'm going to break down. You know, I lost them $500 glasses I've had, and I've been trying to find them ever since, and I've decided I'm not going to be able to find them, so I'm going to break down for Christmas and get me two pairs. <laughs> but you can see much better than I. 2020, maybe. And some of you may have even better than 2020. You can have better than 2020, you know. And some of you can see the finest of print without using a magnifying glass or seeing glasses. But the question is, do you have a vision? Do you have a vision for your own life personally? Do you have a vision for your family? Do you have a vision for your children? Do you have a vision for your church? Do you have a vision? Something that compels you and drives you and tugs you and sometimes wakes you up late at night or early in the morning. You can't even sleep because you're so excited about what God has 
promise to do about what you see God unfolding before your very eyes, do you have a vision? The writer of Proverbs, in our theme verse in Proverbs 29, 18, he says, where, where there's no vision, the people perish. Where there's no vision, where there's no prophetic word, where there's no insight, where people cannot see that things can be better, that there's a better tomorrow possible. And that becomes a driving motivation in their today. So it's my goal and my hope that each and every one of you will start thinking about your own personal vision. Why did God give you life? Why did God put you here? Why did God leave you here? Why has God saved you? Why has God given you the opportunities for education and training and employment, the IQ that you have, the intelligence that you have? Why has God endowed you with so much and invested so much in you? He did it because he has a purpose for your life. God has a purpose for your life. Every single life that God allows to come into existence, God has a purpose for it. And every life has intrinsic value and intrinsic worth. And every human life fits somewhere in God's economy. And God, through a series of events, causes pressures and situations and circumstances to bear upon us. And we recognize our need to be saved. And we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, and we call on him as our personal Savior. And then God gives us the new birth, and we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, of the word of God which lives and abides forever. And we become new creations in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, the new comes. And God starts to loom our hearts and our minds, and he, he releases the scales that covers our eyes and he takes our minds to much higher and loftier places and we start to in entertain grand, lofty, and high thoughts because the illumination of the Holy Spirit. And then God starts to stir something inside of us that we have something to offer and that we have something to contribute and that we are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made and we have intrinsic value and worth and we are created in God's image. And God has placed something inside of us to do that no other person on the planet can accomplish. And so God then moves in us and through us to the Holy Spirit and connects us to a church body, a family, where we can be a part of something larger than what we are and which God himself has promised that he would accomplish his eternal purposes. you got to find your vision. And that's when you become alive. And I'm encouraging you to take what I'm sharing with you seriously. It took me 50 years to get here. And I want other people to find theirs in a shorter period of time than it took me. And those of you who are older, I don't want you to lose any more time on superfluous and trivial pursuits because life is too short, time is too precious, and every single moment, every single second, we want to be as closely aligned as we can with God's will so that we can do what God wants us to do so that our lives will have not been in vain. So you've got to think about your life. And I've shared this with you before. You need to go back and you need to do some chronicling and you need to look back over your life and you need to write down, what am I good at? <laughs> and what am I bad at? And what has been my greatest successes in life and where has my greatest failures been? You've got to write these things down because God speaks to us in the situations and circumstances of life. And there's no experience that you've ever had that was a wasted experience. <laughs> Even though you may have failed royally in broad daylight for everybody to see, but that experience was a part of your portfolio. That experience was a part of your history that God allowed to happen so that you would learn something from it, that something would be impressed upon your life that would help you when you finally realize that God has put me here to do something. As I've shared with you very often, your life's work, you find your life's work as you go back and look at your life and where your deepest pain and your deepest hurt has been. That's where you've been marked and branded for the rest of your life. And very often God will speak to you in that area and God will use you in that way. you got to do that. It's important for you to do that because your life will never become an exciting adventure. Most people live in holy boredom, even Christians. And most Christian people settle for a life 
much below what God intended for them to live. Because everybody else is settling for a life much below what God intended for them to live. But there are a few people that have the regal courage to believe God and to trust God and to step out and say, I just want to do what God has called me to do. I want my life to fulfill that which God intended for it to fulfill. And once you do that, life becomes an exciting adventure. Because you start seeing God not only in the big things, but you start seeing God's divine providential hand in the little things. In the minute, mundane things of life, you see that there is a divine sovereign hand that's orchestrating events and affairs. And God has taken even the wrong decisions you've made, but because your heart now is bent toward him, Paul says in Romans 8, 28, but we know that all things work together for good for them who love God, for them who are called according to his purpose. That's how masterful God's plan is. He calls this everything to work for good. You know, back in the day, I knew a little bit about chemistry. I don't know a whole lot now because I haven't even cracked a chemistry book in probably 25 years. But this was what I do know. I know that table salt is made out of two elements. Sodium and chloride. Any one of them by themselves will kill you dead in last year's love. But when you combine them together, and because of the chemical reaction that takes place, sodium and chloride becomes table salt. Something you use to basically salt your and season your food. And in the chemistry world, there are a lot of chemicals like that. You take one of them by themselves and they will kill you. But when you combine them under the watchful, skillful hand of a formulator, you come up with products and foods and beverages and preservatives and so forth. That's the way life is. Any one of life experiences by itself could drive you to commit suicide. At any given point in time, you want to terminate your own life if you just looked at one situation. But your life must be looked at from the 35,000 square foot a 35,000 feet panorama, that God is bringing some things together. And then when God brings these things together, he creates a beautiful mosaic that you call a life. And rather than killing you, it fine-tunes you and calibrates you and sensitizes you to God's Holy Spirit to where now you become an instrument in God's hand to do great things for God's glory. But you must be determined to find your purpose. And my, no matter where it might lead, no matter where it might go, and you cannot look at any one snapshot and conclude that I made a mistake. No, you keep on believing and trusting God, regardless of where you might be today, and believe that some kind of way God can take what was a mistake yesterday that got me in a bad spot today. But if I lean on God today and trust God today, and I trust my own understanding today, some kind of way God can take that mistake in this tough spot and get me back where I need to be, where I can sense his hand and sense his blessings upon my life. Well, if you wasn't in a hurry, I would take my time. But you're in a hurry, so I'm not going to take my time. I'm going to get right here and work with this thing a bit. The first thing I called your attention, that pursuing your vision is the only thing that will bring you fulfillment. The pursuit of your vision. The purpose is why God created you. The vision is the motivation that God gives you to seek after the purpose that he gave you life. You see, vision is foresight. It is foresight into something that's out there in front of you. Foresight based on hindsight of what's already behind you and based on insight of what God is telling you. So it's foresight based on hindsight with the benefit of God's insight to keep you moving forward every day, every hour, every second, every minute. In Ecclesiastes 3.13, the writer of Ecclesiastes, Solomon says that everyone may eat and drink and find satisfaction <clears throat> in his tale. This is the gift of God, that everybody might eat and drink and find satisfaction in your toil, in your work, in your labor, but that is the gift of God. God wants us to eat, God wants us to drink, but God wants us to find satisfaction. He wants us to find a sense of meaning and purpose that our lives are more than just a string of disconnected, discombobulated events and activities, but there's purpose to it all, and we find in our toil, in our labor, a sense of satisfaction. I'm accomplishing something of significance and importance. 
In Proverbs 19, 21, the writer of Proverbs says, Many are the plans in a man's heart, but it's the Lord's that prevails. There might be a whole lot of things in your heart and a whole lot of things in your head. But when you're seeking the will of God and seeking to do God's will, then God will cause his thoughts and his ideas to prevail. His thought and his ideas will grab hold to your heart and will not let you go. It will grab hold to your emotions and to your passions and cause you to be drawn to that which God would have you to do. That's why Jesus in Matthew 6.33 says, seek you first what? The kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God in a Jewish mind, seek first the rule of God. Seek first the reign of God as we seek God's rule in our lives. As we seek God's reign in our lives. As we seek the lordship of Christ in our lives. Seek ye first the kingdom, the basileia, the rule of God. If you seek those things first, then everything that you need to accomplish God's will will be added unto you. Jesus says himself in Matthew 6, 33. Are you following me? That's important. You see, because going against your purpose, it may be a personal choice that you have, but it's never private consequences. You can go against your purpose. It might be your choice. I'm going to do what I think I'm big enough and bad enough to do. It's your personal choice. God will allow you to disobey him. God will allow you to rebel against him. Because what distinguishes us from the animals is that we don't operate merely on instinct. We have cognitive thought processes, and we reason, and we deliberate, and we choose, and we make choices, and we have this gift of the will. So we make personal choices, but our personal choices will not result in private outcomes. There will be private consequences. And if I had time, I would summon Jonah to testify. You Bible scholars, you know about Jonah, don't you? And Jonah was a man of God, and God told Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, I don't think so. So Jonah got on a boat going to the exact object of Nineveh. Now, why didn't Jonah want to go to Nineveh? Because Nineveh was where the Syrians were, and the Syrians had wreaked havoc against the Jews. They had their throat on the Jews' throat. They had brutalized them. They had mistreated them. They took advantage of them. And Jonah knew, if I go to Nineveh and preach... They're going to repent. And if they repent, God's going to forgive them. But I don't want God to forgive them. He said, I want God to get them. But if I preach, they're going to repent. And God, he's a soft heart. He's going to forgive. So I'm not going to go and preach to him. So Jonah jumped on the boat, and he was going to Tarsus, the exact opposite direction of Nineveh. A personal choice. A private choice that he made. But he had a public consequence because God can find you, even in the belly of the ship. So Joseph, Jonah was down in the belly, down in the bottom of the ship, fast asleep. But God caused a great storm to rock and to reel the ship. And everybody on the ship's life was in danger because of Jonah's choice. Listen to me, mama. Listen to me, father. We make choices. Our choices affect everybody's life who's attached to us. And so when we make a decision that we aren't going to go to church and we're not going to serve God and we're not going to pray and we're not going to read the word of God and we're going to watch pornographic movies and we're going to have all this stuff piped in our houses and we're going to be accessing filth on the internet, but we say, we grow. We can do what we want to do. We know how far to go, and we can take fire in our bosom, and we're not going to get burned by it. We understand that our children, we're deceiving ourselves, but our children may not have the spiritual resistance that we have. They may not have the immune system that we have developed over the years, and we have been inoculated with the truth that grandmama put in us, and we don't realize that. We would sleep, our grandma was anointing us in oil and slapping us upside the head. And God had put something inside of us because of our grandmamas and our mamas and our aunts and our uncles. And so we can go so far and then something just grab hold of us and pull us back. But we haven't done it for our children. So they ain't got in them what we got in us. So what we can play with and dance right up to and be tantalized by and excited by 
and have all type of erotic ideas about it. And then at the last minute, Sister Dorothy, we back off from it. But our children are consumed into it. Our private choices have public consequences and outcome for our children. Are y'all listening to me? Yeah. Let me tell you, the older I get, the older I get, the thing I don't want to do sometimes is go outside. I said, if I just stay in here, maybe I can just stay away from some crazy stuff. If I just stay in here, maybe I won't do something because I have this great fear. I don't want to embarrass God, and I don't want to embarrass the church. One of my goals in life is just to get out of here without bringing shame to y'all, without disgracing y'all. So I'm living tight every single day. I got to watch where I go. I, I can't go into a public place, and I can't sit down with a female in a public place because somebody might say, well, he's out there in the public with somebody, and that wasn't his wife. So you're not going to see me in a public place without a female, without my wife, there are other people around. There are certain things you just can't do. So a certain amount of pressure is brought to bear every single day, everything you say, every comment that you make, every observation that you make because you don't want to embarrass Christ, you don't want to embarrass the church, you don't want to lose your effectiveness to speak on behalf of God. Personal choices have public consequences. Jonah found that out. So finally, Jonah fessed up to it and said, man, y'all just got to throw me in the water. <laughs> just got to throw me on in the water because it's not fair for me to allow all y'all lives to be destroyed. Do you know the rest of the story? Our personal choices, our private choices, will often have unintended consequence. The second thing I want to bring to your attention is that vision requires a vital connection with God a vital connection with God, we must develop a greater God consciousness. And we must be thinking about God as we're walking, as we're working, as we're doing different things, because we really must maintain this connection to God in an ongoing way, uninterrupted fellowship and communion with him, so that in every situation when we have to make a decision, that we're making a decision based on what God's word is directing us and guiding us and that the Holy Spirit is leading us. God saves us in order to fulfill his original purpose in us. So if we're going to fulfill the vision, then we've got to stay connected to God because God has an original purpose. And we saw that in Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For we are his workmanship. We are God's handiwork. We are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God before the foundation of the world ordained. Once we start understanding that our lives really do matter and how we live matters and what we do matters, it matters to God and it matters to eternity. The psalmist writes in Psalm 37, 4, if we delight in the Lord, then he will give us the desires of our heart. If we delight in him, then God will grab hold to our heart and then the things that start bubbling up inside of our hearts will be the very things that God wants for us since then we're delighting in him and the things in our heart are the things that God wants for us, then God can give us what we want. Because what we want is what God wants us to have. Vision requires a vital connection with God to fulfill his purpose. We delight in him. That's why in Romans 12, 1 through 3, Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And what is Paul talking about? Paul says we live inside of bodies. God has put our spirits and our souls inside of our spiritual, our physical bodies. And Paul says so now our physical bodies contain our souls and our spirits, and now the Holy Spirit so God wants to control these physical bodies, but he says he won't control them against our will. So we got to commit ourselves, present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. And someone said the problem with the living sacrifice, they always want to crawl off the altar, you see. A dead sacrifice, you just slit the goat's throat, the blood splat, he ain't going to bye bye no more. He's not going nowhere. But a living sacrifice always wants to slither off the altar. A living sacrifice. 
And then God can change and transform our minds. And as God is transforming our minds, he is causing us to be more intimately connected to him. Are you following me? Christianity is for thinking people. There's a place for shouting and dancing and praising God and waving your hands and getting all sweaty and getting all you a wonderful place for that. But after all that is done, you live this life inside this body. And inside this body, inside your head, there's a mind. And that mind is used to control what this body does. And so God wants that mind to be controlled by the Holy Spirit and by transcendent spiritual truth that's contained in the Bible so that when we make decisions, we're making decisions in light of what God has to say so the outcome will be the outcome that God wants to see. So personal holiness is important. How we live is important. Now I'm going to preach a sermon on Hebrews chapter 13 where the writer of Hebrews says to the church, he says to the believers, that they, that their spiritual leaders have to give account for their souls. Read Hebrews 13. It says that as a parishioner, you should show respect for those in spiritual leadership because they have to give account for your souls. Then the last time I looked, your soul was inside your body. And your soul is invisible. I can't see it. So I got to watch what you're doing with your body. Because the only way I can watch over your soul is watch your body and make sure you don't use your body to do anything that would be unpleasing to God because when you use your body as an instrument of unrighteousness, you've just sinned against your soul. That was awful quiet. But I thank God for the choir because at least I got some help over here, you see. (laughs) That's another sermon. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 10. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is one of these scriptures that are just, it's a mind-boggling scripture that the Apostle Paul writes here as the Holy Spirit leads him to write. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, look at verse 3. Paul says, for though we walk in the flesh, Paul said, we're not some type of spiritual aberrations. We are men, and we are walking in the flesh as men, as human beings. He says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. He says, we understand we really are in a spiritual war with principalities and powers and spiritual weakness in high places. So we don't war after the flesh, even though we walk in the flesh. Then he says, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And then in verse 5 of 2 Corinthians 10, Paul illustrates and he elucidates how you pull down strongholds. Look at verse 5. He says, casting down imaginations or reasoning and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. <laughs> Paul says the most fierce battle that you ever raise, wage is right here. <laughs> That's the battle of all battles. The battle inside your own mind. Where your mind is entertaining thoughts based on past experiences based on the enemy's deception to rouse certain desires and passions on the inside of you that are consistent with pleasure. Now the pleasure sensor starts to kick in. You know if I do that, that's going to feel good. So now the mind is saying, you know you ought to do it because you're going to feel good when you do it. But at the same time, God's truth is also inside your mind. And God's truth is also saying that the soul that sins shall surely die. God's truth is saying that thou shalt not do such and such and so and so. So the battle has been waged in the mind, and then you and I have to make the decision to choose to to obey God, even though everything inside of us want to do something else. So Paul says we got to bring down every thought, every idea that elevates itself up 
It's opposed in opposition to God's word. We got to grab hold to it and we got to bring it and submit it under God's word and say, no, we will obey God's word because God's word is the ultimate truth. Are you following me? That's how we maintain a vital connection with God. It's when ain't nobody looking and nobody is watching and nobody is listening to the conversation between your two ears. It is that conversation that determines whether or not we win in this spiritual battle on a day-to-day basis. And so Paul says this battle has to be waged, and the only way we can fortify the mind to have the type of intellectual and spiritual resistance that it needs is by the Word of God and by prayer and by fellowship and talking about God and talking about God's Word and having conversation about God so that in our Subconscious mind is the truth of God. So the truth of God is in our subconscious mind so that we have to make a decision in our conscious mind, then there's something for the Holy Spirit to activate in our subconscious mind to bring it to the front of lobe where decisions are being made so we might make the right choice in time. Are you following me? Some decisions you ain't got time to think about it. You make it in a split second, in an instance, and you make it from what's in your subconscious mind and where you've already stored this stuff away at, and then you're able to make that decision in time. Oh, I wish I had a friend in church this morning, Sister Dorothy, because there have been times when I made decisions, and then I, had, I was sweating when I made it. I said, wow, that was close. That was too close for comfort, you see. Thank God for the Holy Ghost, because I know I didn't make that decision. That's what Paul is talking about. And some of y'all, when y'all stop acting so spiritual, you know there have been in situations when you came oh so close and you don't know how you escaped and got by. Let me tell you how. The Holy Ghost grabbed you and swept you up and got you up out of there. Well, we got to maintain this vital connection with God. Thirdly, Personal vision must be aligned with corporate vision. Personal vision must be aligned with corporate vision. God will often give a a corporate vision to an individual to share with the people, and the vision is then transferred to the people, and the corporate vision then stirs something inside the people where they realize I can connect with this and I can fulfill the personal vision that I have on the inside of me because what God is doing is always larger than any one individual. Are y'all listening to me? What God is doing is always bigger than any one person, any one individual, and no one individual can accomplish God's will for their own life. They need other people helping them to accomplish God's will for their lives. Well, if I had some people to testify, There was Moses. Moses had the vision for the promised land. God put it in his heart that he was going to use Moses to lead the people to the promised land. But Moses needed the elders, needed the wise counsel of Jethro, and needed other people to help him to mobilize the people to move them toward the promised land. Joshua had the vision of, of possessing the land, of going in and possessing it and dividing the land up. And he was a brilliant military strategist. But it was the soldiers, it was the counselors and the leaders that helped him fulfill the vision. David had a vision for settling the land and expanding the boundaries of the territory. But David had his mighty men of valor, and they were some courageous folk. As a matter of fact, they were so courageous and they were so devoted to David that David was in exile, a king without a throne, had been ran out of town, and he was hiding in a cave. And David just thought something out loud, Oh, if I had some water from the brooks of Jerusalem. He was just thinking out loud and daydreaming about what it used to be when he was back at home. And some of his men heard him say that. And they loved him so much and they were so devoted to him that they got up, got on their beast of burden, went on a reconnaissance mission, went behind the enemy lines and got a pitcher full of water. And they brought it back to him, and they presented it to him. And when they presented that water to David, something on the inside of him literally just shrunk. And he says, my thinking out loud, just a casual thought, has caused these men to risk their lives to get me a drink of water. 
And David took the water, and he says, I can't drink this water. This water has the price of blood connected to it. So he pours it out on the ground as a sacrificial offering to God. So if these men understood, I understand the sacrifice that you made. I understand the devotion and the loyalty that you have, and I'm not going to exploit you in any situation for my own personal comfort and convenience. Are you following me? Let me tell you something. If you want to lead, you got to sacrifice. you got to get up before everybody else get up, and you got to be the last one going to bed. And the last one leaving the church, and you flushing the toilets when folk don't flush them. And you going behind people complaining, but you turn out the lights. Because if you're going to leave, you got to sacrifice. Because the people got to believe that the person who's leading is willing to sacrifice for the people. And that goes for Sunday school teachers and deacons. That goes for bus drivers. That goes for trustees. You can't leave unless you're willing to sacrifice your personal comfort, your personal convenience, because the people are worthy of the sacrifice. Because Jesus has already sacrificed and shed his own blood for the people. And the people belong to God. They belong to him. And so you serve folk by studying your Sunday school lesson and not flying in the door with papers flying all over the place because you haven't studied and you're not ready and prepared. Sunday come every week. There's never an excuse for me to show up here in the pulpit and not be prepared. Now, I may not deliver the sermon well, but I know the next Sunday is coming. I know that already. Getting awful quiet up in here. <laughs> because when you talk about sacrifice, that's a word that's foreign in the American culture, even in the church. Well, Nehemiah had a vision to rebuild a wall. And he left the comfort and convenience of Babylon to go back to a city that was in disgrace and shame and mobilize the people. Well, the personal vision must be aligned with the corporate vision. Fourthly, we must work together to fulfill the corporate vision. We got to work together to do it. We got to work together to do it. We cannot do a great work for God unless we work together. When I try to encourage you to get into discipleship class, it isn't because I don't think you've got anything else to do. It's just that I know that if we're going to do this together, we've got to connect together in relationship. We've got to spend time with each other, studying God's word, hearing from the Holy Spirit, how him, having him to knit our hearts together to where we start trusting each other and believing each other. And we can't get there passing through each other in the sanctuary and passing through each other in the parking lot. We've got to spend some time with each other around the word of God, wrestling with the text because we've got to work together. The last thing I want to say, I'm going to take my seat. God uses spiritual visionaries to draw the vision that's in us out of us. God uses spiritual visionaries to draw the vision that God has placed inside of you. Now listen closely. It is not my job to give you a personal vision. That's God's job. And I believe that God has a purpose for each and every one of you who name the name of Christ, and God has placed a vision on the inside of you. It's in, on the inside of you. Now, my job as a spiritual visionary is to try to stir you up and challenge you and provoke you in a good way to where you start thinking about what did God put me here to do? Proverbs 20, verse 5 says, The purposes of a man's heart are like deep waters, but a man of understanding draws it out, you see. There are things on the inside of you, and those of you who are spiritual leaders, your job is not just to teach people the Bible. Your job is to help people to learn to accept the word of God and apply it to their life, and every now and then they ought to leave the class mad. Because you've challenged them with the word of God to take that word and allow that word of God to go down inside of them. And when God's word starts to, to, to churn inside of us and stir stuff up and make us feel uncomfortable, we often get mad at the truth teller. That's why in the Old Testament they stoned the prophets. <laughs> That's not anything new. But the spiritual visionary's job is to draw it out of the people. The people can always do more than what they think they can do. The people have skills and talents and gifts that they have not yet developed and perfected. And so we're trying to draw it out of the people. 
And so we cast the vision to stir the people. To start look inwardly and say, what, God, what has God called me to do? And so we go back to Acts chapter 2. Where Peter said, that God said, in the last day, I'm going to pour my spirit out on all flesh. And young men shall see visions. And old men shall dream dreams. And the people of God will speak the word of God, and they'll speak the truth of God. So what really does all this mean? That pursuing our vision is the only thing that will bring us fulfillment. The vision requires a vital connection with God. The personal vision must be aligned with a corporate vision that God is bringing about through his people, through his assembly. We must work together to do it. And the spiritual leaders have a primary responsibility to cast an overarching vision and then help the individuals find their place and how they can find fulfillment in fulfilling their vision as they have propelled a much larger vision of what God is doing. So it, didn't, it, it comes all the way back. And that's why it's important. You single mothers, get your kids in church. Because part of whatever vision you have for your life has to be bringing your children to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Doing all you can to bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And believing that whatever God started in your life, he may not finish it in your life. It will continue in the lives of your children. As fathers, we've got to nurture our own children, pray for our own children, encourage our own children. And in this church, this community, as men, we've got to open our arms up where our arms are wide enough to embrace other children and realize that we have a responsibility to try to be the father for as many children as we possibly can who have no father to build into their lives. See, those of you who have been elevated to stature and in positions with education in your job, in various fields of endeavor, you've got to understand that God put you there not just for you, but for his kingdom. And you've got to take everything that you've learned, everything you know, and pray to God and submit it to God and say, Lord, how do I use the skills, the education, the ability, the resources that I have to help advance your kingdom that has to be a part of your vision? You young people got to understand that your role is not just to eat up all the food, make all the mess, and be carried all up and down the road. No, there's something you have to do as young people to realize that God has a role for you to play even as a young person to represent him in the school, on the playground, on the basketball court, on the football team. That we must start thinking about the fact that I represent God. And I want to represent him accurately and properly to the world. And we all start thinking like that. If God could take 12, and one of them was a devil, so he disqualified himself. But the other 11, they were basically uneducated in terms of formal theological training. They had some skills. They could fish, and you know, they could collect taxes, and they could knock people in the head. They had some skills. <laughs> they had some skills. But they didn't have the skills that you would think that you would build a movement on let alone a kingdom, <laughs> and he took those 11, and he imparted a vision in them, and they caught it, and they found in the vision that he had cast for them, that they go into all the world and make disciples, they found a personal vision in terms of what their role would be as preachers, as apostles, as evangelists, as teachers, as pastors, you see, and now we're here because of them. Well, I close with this. I don't have any small dreams anything anymore. They're all big. Because what I figured out, and my children figured this out, my children figured out pretty early that we can ask them for a dime or we can ask them for a dollar, you see. And they figured out if he has a dime, he probably got a dollar. And then they figured out if he has a dollar when they got a little bit older, he got a 10. And if he has a 10, he probably got a 20. So they got to where they didn't ask for anything less than a 50. As a matter of fact, one of my daughters used to say, oh, 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 she said, oh, Pops, uh, which dead president do you have in your pocket? <laughs> She's one, which one do you have? 
That's the one I want. What I done figured out, that whether I ask God for a dime or $10 million, with him there's no effort. And I'm not suggesting we just ask God for money. I think that what we should be asking God for is to expand our banners and our territories to win souls for Jesus and to disciple people and see a harvest of souls, the things that are really important and that are really valuable. And I just thought about it tell you, it's time for us to start believing God for great things. Why can't we believe God for the West Side? Why can't we believe God for revival to break out on the west side and so the young men stand on the street corner with weapons in their pockets and drugs in their pockets, have Bibles in their hands and tracts in their hands talking about Jesus? Why is it we can't believe God for the west side of Charleston? For the west side of Charleston. To believe that even those young girls, and every time I go, you know, Brother Ben Tolliver has taught me so many things over the years. And I'm going to close with this. I think the most important lesson I learned from Ben Tolliver that every Christian man, you got to have a fishing hole. You got to have a fishing hole. Brother Ben Tolliver has always had two washers and two dryers in his house. But every week for years, he'd be up at straight laundry mat washing and drying his clothes. And one day I said, Brother Ben, I just don't understand it. Why would you buy two washers and two dryers and have them in your house and still take your clothes to the laundromat? And he said, oh, oh, preacher, that's just my fishing hole. That's just my fishing hole. And then I started talking to folk all over the East End, and I would say, well, I want you to come to Grace Bible Church. And they would say, well, ain't that where Brother Ben Tolliver go? I said, well, how do you know that? They said, well, I met him at straight laundromat. That was his fishing hole. Well, I done found me a fishing hole, and my fishing hole is Shoney's. It's the major thoroughfare for the east side and the west side. And sometimes I go up to Shoney's, and I just say, give me a glass of water and a couple of lemons and a, and, a, and a couple pieces of toast. That's my fishing hole. And I'm amazed at how many folk I've met right there in Shoney's to talk to them about the Lord. And these young girls come, and they pragging the belly, sticking way out, and they trying to serve me. And the first thing I say, girl, when the last time you've been to the doctor? Are you taking your vitamins? Are you just getting all your prenatal visits? Don't you know there's somebody on the inside of you depending on you and their mind has been developed? Do you talk to your baby? How are you taking care of yourself? Well, that's become my fishing hole, y'all. It's what I'm trying to tell you. We all got to find us a fishing hole somewhere where we connect with people in the thoroughfare of life and we show compassion and love and sensitivity and understanding and we tell people about Jesus. We tell them what he's done in our lives. We tell them what he's done for us. We tell the story of how we've overcome difficulty and hardship and depression and grief and rebellious children. We tell them about the pain and the hurt that we've experienced, but our God sent a healing bomb of Gilead. And if we do that, we will legitimize ourselves as the people of God. Not some stained glass folk that commute back and forth to heaven, but people of like passion. People have been wounded and been scarred, have been disfigured. People have been hurt and betrayed and let down. People have been abandoned, but we found in Jesus a friend that sticks closer than a brother. So everything we do, my beloved brethren, it's not to attract attention to ourselves. It's just to attract attention to Jesus so we can talk about how wonderful he is, how marvelous he is, how glorious he is. I'm not through, but I'm out of time, and I thank you for yours. This is real life. This is not a dress rehearsal. Every second counts, every minute counts, every hour counts, every day is already chronicled in eternity. And so we got to live life on purpose. Realizing that as Christians, listen to me, as Christians, one day we're going to stand before Jesus Christ. Not to be judged for our sin, because our sin has already been judged on the cross. He's already paid for our sin. That's already taken care of if we've accepted him. But we got to give account to him for how we lived our lives after we trusted him. After we knew that we were saved. After we knew that we were stewards. After we knew that we were to be his ambassadors, we're going to give account to him. And hopefully we'll hear him say, well done. 
only one life, and soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, we bow before you in humble submission. We acknowledge your greatness, your grandeur, and your splendor. And everything that you have created, you created for your own glory, for the praise, the honor, and the exaltation of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the one whose first advent we now observe, while simultaneously looking and expecting his second return. I pray, Lord, for everyone in the sound of my voice, for those believers, Lord, that they would surrender and submit to you by simply saying, Lord, I want to do your will. Stir up the gift inside of me. Show me what you've put me here to do. And energize me to have the courage to step out and do it. For those men, women, boys, and girls who've never accepted Christ as their personal Savior, Father, I pray that right now, where, where they are, they realize that the Bible is true when it says that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That the wages, the penalty, the punishment for sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And I pray, Lord, that that one who's never accepted Christ will realize that you love them. You love them regardless of what they've done. You knew what they would do before they ever did it. And you loved them beforehand. And now, Lord, you offer them a free gift of salvation. You offer to them forgiveness and a pardon. But they must turn to you and say, Lord Jesus, I know that I am a sinner. I believe that you died for me. You are buried and rose from the dead. I trust you as my personal Savior. Come into my life. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus, and save me. Father, I pray that if they, as, as some pray that prayer, they will sense your forgiveness. In Jesus' name. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here this morning. Been to church many times. Heard many sermons. But you've never put your faith in Jesus Christ. You never called on him to be your Lord and Savior. If you prayed that prayer a moment ago, or if you want to pray it right now, just ask the Lord to come into your heart and to save you. And he will do it. And it will be the beginning of an exciting adventure. If you're here and if you prayed that prayer, just raise your hand right where you are. We're not going to embarrass you. No one's going to ask you to walk to the front and make no long speech. We will have someone to come and talk to you and just share with you from God's word. Someone just to pray with you. Not to badger you or make you do something you don't want to do. So just raise your hand right where you are. If you prayed that prayer, if you'd like for someone to come and pray with you and talk with you. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time. We can't get this day back. We cannot get this moment back. God has allowed us to have this moment in time to meet with him and to fellowship with him. And someone else, you just want to be saved. Maybe you're not even sure where you stand with God. You've prayed prayers, you've walked down aisles, you've been dumped in water, but you're just not sure where you stand. Why don't you just settle it once and for all? God loves you. Jesus died for you. You count. You matter to God. And others might say that you're no good or you never amount to anything, but God says you count, you matter, your life matters to him. If you surrender to him today, all things become new. Is there one? Maybe you already are saved, but you need to recommit your life to Christ, or you, reach, you need to connect with the local church. There are a lot of wonderful churches in this city. It would be our great joy to have you to become a part of the Grace Bible Church family. We'll give you our best to serve you, to minister to you and your family and try to encourage you and help you grow in your walk with Jesus Christ. If you're saved and you're looking for a church home, just stand to your feet and let us, let us talk with you and encourage you. Come unite with us. If you're backslidden and need to recommit your life to Christ, or maybe you're just kind of not quite sure where you are, now is the time. Today is the day. 
I've come too far. I've come too far from where I thought it was. Nobody told me. Nobody told me that the road would be easy. I don't believe he's left. I don't feel no ways tired. I tell you what, even if you do feel tired, he won't leave you. I've come too far. I've come too far from where I thought it was. So far. the road would be easy. I don't believe he brought me this far to lead me. Amen. Amen. Let God be praised. And let all of God's people be encouraged. This is our time to serve him. This is our hour. Donald Rumsfeld made a statement once a lot of people criticized him for, but I understand exactly what he's saying. He says, you don't get the army you want to go to war with. You got to go to war with the one you got. So when the war starts, whatever army you got, that's the one you got to use. So in this life, we're in a war. And we don't get to feel the way we want to feel. and We don't get things to be the way we want them to be because the enemy, he doesn't relent. And he's not going to say, well, I'm going to be fair. Get your act together. Get everything together. Then we can have this war. It's not the way it is. Sometimes you've got this wage war. Your helmet is on cockeyed. You know, your uniform is all tore up. Your gun might shoot and might not shoot. But you've got to show up, and if the gun don't shoot, you just got to swing it at Just swing it at the devil. We wage this warfare with what God has given us. What he's given us is what we need because he's promised, he's promised to compensate and make up for whatever we don't have. So you be encouraged in Jesus' name. You are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen nation, a peculiar people, the ambassadors of Jesus Christ. God himself has deputized you with his Holy Spirit to represent him on the earth. And when you speak under the power of the Holy Spirit and with the anointing of God, it's more powerful than the ear of honey. Because when you speak, the angels listen to what you have to say. And God is doing great and wonderful, marvelous things through many of you that you don't even realize. The impact that you are having in people's lives. And you know how you have sometimes the greatest impact? Just by showing up every day. And say, I'm still on the Lord's side. I'm still on the Lord's side. I'm still trying to serve him. And people start looking around and looking behind you to see what's holding you up. And they conclude there must be a God somewhere because I don't even see how they could be still standing and let alone testify in the name of the Lord. So you be encouraged. Let's use this holiday season to be reminded that he came here be born in a manger, wrapped in rags, so he could bring salvation by giving his life on the cross of Calvary. And so we celebrate his love for us and say thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift. I don't know about you, but there's nowhere else in the world I'd want to be than right here at Grace Bible Church. There's no other job that I want to have and lead the people here. This is my life's work. And I'm like Rich Rodriguez. I'm not going to leave to give me three. Oh, he didn't change his mind, did he? <laughs> Let's stand together, shall we? <laughs> Nobody told me that the road would be easy. Bless you, baby. Bless you, baby. Bless you.
God to bless you. Hang on, baby.